Good morning. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but I hope that in the lecture that follows, I will give you an insight into the chemistry that underpins some of the astrobiology. I'm Nigel Mason. I'm in Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Kent, and I'm also president of the Europlanet Society and coordinator of the Europlanet Research Infrastructure. Europlanet is an organization that looks to support planetary science in Europe. It has a very active early career group, the early career group of Astrobiology of Europlanet. And I advise any of you who are currently in this meeting who might be interested in more in planetary sciences, it also includes astrobiology and astrochemistry, to join the Europlanet early career group. Without further ado, let me then discuss astrochemistry for astrobiology. Perhaps the greatest unanswered questions of modern science are the following. Where and how did life begin on Earth? And is there life elsewhere in the universe? To answer those questions, we need to set a series of scientific questions. The first of which is, are the conditions for sustaining life common throughout the universe? Or is there something special about our planet, the Earth-Moon system, in our solar system, in our part of the Milky Way? The second question is, in trying to understand the formation of life and the molecules of life, how is the material which is necessary to be assembled to make life uh, formed, what we often call the prebiotic material, the molecules and the systems which were finally assembled to make the cells and the DNA and ultimately organisms like ourselves. To understand how life was formed, we need to therefore understand how the chemical elements of life are made and how they are subsequently assembled into molecules and more complex systems like cells. So let us begin by thinking what are the major chemical elements of life? Here we are led by the only form of life that we know being based upon DNA. And the molecules of DNA, the molecules that compose DNA, the nuclear bases and the nucleotides, are all composed of the following elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and one which is often forgotten, phosphorus. We can also add to this list another molecule that's believed to be essential for life, and that is sulfur. Now, the DNA was not formed in one go. It was almost certainly assembled from smaller molecules, like the amino acids and the nuclear bases. And the other forms of the cell, the lipid membranes, require fatty acids, and we need carbohydrates. So in looking to assemble DNA, what we first of all need to do to try and think about what were the building blocks of DNA and other life forming molecules, proteins, the phospholipids for cell membranes, for example, polysaccharides, as well as the DNA and the RNA. So, what do we know about the synthesis of the elements? Well, we know that uh, in the first few seconds of the Big Bang, uh, elements only were only very light elements, hydrogen, helium, maybe a little bit of lithium. All the other elements that we know basically form subsequently, particularly through star formation. Indeed, this is perhaps one of the first clues to answer the question, is life everywhere? Chetek Info is a, a new infrastructure in Europe established uh, starting last year which brings together people from the active field of nuclear astrophysics to consider this question. Uh, how are the elements formed? And are they common in the same way in all star systems and places across the universe? The answer to that question is no. Some stars are more rich in elements than the others. The fact that we have a large degree of phosphorus in the DNA might suggest that at some stage, our solar system harks back to stars that were phosphor rich. There are stars that are phosphor rich, but unfortunately, their mechanism for being formed doesn't fit the standard models for many of the stellar synthesis processes. And so that's another example of where we need to look. 
at um, some basic understandings of how the universe formed. What do we know? Well, what we do know is that in the interstellar medium, that is that apparent regions of emptiness in space, many, many molecules exist. Indeed, about 230 individual molecular species have now been identified. And those molecular species consist of 16 different elements. The molecules themselves vary in size from diatomics like oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, through to very more complicated systems, uh, like for example, carbon 70. Due to the development of the ALMA telescope and soon the JWST telescope, we expect to find many more of these molecules in space. Indeed, our detection of these molecules is increasing rapidly. And just in 2021, last year, these are some of the recent molecules that were identified for the first time in interstellar space. You will see that they compose of the common carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen compounds, and there are many chain compounds. And indeed, that's partly because of the detection techniques which we use. We can also put these into a table and we can look at other molecules that have been found. I just want to point out a few. Formic acid, which you perhaps might know from, from ants. Acetic acid, vinegar. Glycolaldehyde, that first simple sugar. And glycine, that first amino acid. Now, although the, there is still some debate of whether that has been detected comprehensively in space or not, it's a vast belief amongst astrochemists that it is there. And it's just a matter of having the sensitivity and the detection efficiency to see it. And I think with JWST, we probably will identify glycine and perhaps many other means. There are also other compounds in space, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, uh, ring-like structures, which of course we can consider as the simplest one being benzene. And then there are other long chain molecules, which we don't find naturally on earth, which are basically chains of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, which are called cyanopolines. These may exist and do it on, on Titan uh, in our own solar system, but are not seemingly found naturally or made naturally on the earth today. So the big question for astrochemistry and to, as an underpinning part of astrobiology is how are these molecules formed? In any chemistry, there are two types of process that we look at, what we call top down and bottom up. Top down means that we start with some structure, uh, like for example, as we'll see in a moment, uh, dust grains in space or larger polyaromatic hydrocarbons and fullerenes. And these are basically gradually broken up to make the smaller molecules. Alternatively, and perhaps the way that most work has been done to date, we start with taking those atoms, which we talked about, making them into diatomic molecules, and gradually growing the molecules, the simple molecules, to more complex molecules in a steady bottom-up process. Although we may have many hypotheses about how these molecules are found, what we really need to be able to do is to perform experiments to see if those hypotheses are true and get some clue as to how the molecules of life may be made. Perhaps the most famous experiment, and indeed the earliest experiment, was by Harold Ure and Stanley Miller. And many of you will have heard of the Ure Miller, or sometimes the Miller Ure experiment. They wished to show how molecules may have been formed in the early Earth's atmosphere. And basically what they proposed, the idea, as you can see the cursor here, was that the early Earth's atmosphere was made up of molecules like methane, ammonia, and hydrogen, which was also mixed with water vapor from the early Earth's oceans. This molecular mixture was then exposed to radiation in some form. They thought the energy might come from lightning in the early Earth's atmosphere. So they mimicked this by an electrical discharge of these molecules acting together. Molecules made in the lightning, made in the discharge, would then be condensed, cooled, dissolve in the liquid water, and form a kind of sludge at the bottom here, which could be taken away for analysis. And what they hoped 
was by reacting with all these molecules, they would be able to make some of the molecules of life underpinning life, like glycine and the amino acids. They ran that experiment for a week before extracting the liquid from the flask. They analyzed it in a rather, today, very crude way. They didn't have the analytical uh, instruments that we have today, uh, LCMS, GCMS, etc. But nonetheless, they identified three amino acids being formed in this mixture, glycine being one, and alpha and beta alanine being another. And this was a fundamental breakthrough experiment. It showed that it was possible to assemble the molecules of life uh, to start the process of prebiotic chemistry under very simple conditions, like, for example, lightning in the Earth's atmosphere. However, we now know that that experiment wasn't a good replicate of the early Earth's atmosphere. Indeed, the early Earth's atmosphere was much more rich in carbon dioxide and SO2 due to the high levels of volcanology in the early Earth. And when you repeat those experiments with a more representative mixture, you make far less of the sort of molecules of glycine and amino acids that you'd really like. But the major problem is that if you try and calculate how much material would have to be processed to make the amount of DNA and life that we currently have on Earth, the processing time would vastly exceed the time of the Earth today. And so we wouldn't be here yet. The other problem is this early Earth prebiotic atmosphere, a weekly reducing atmosphere, was, soon, was changed during the history of the Earth into the modern atmosphere we have today, which is a much more oxidizing atmosphere, which is not good for making some of the molecules that we've just talked about. So if the building blocks could not be made on the Earth, could they have been brought to the Earth at the beginning? We know that all planets are formed as part of the star planet forming process. And that the prebiotic molecules that are formed in the uh, interstellar medium in the, dust, in the dust cloud that collapses to form a star and a planet, they might be able to exist and survive that process and therefore be available to seed, if you like, the planets themselves, perhaps through the parts like asteroids and so on, which didn't ever quite get around to being formed part of a planet. Is that uh, a realistic model? Well, let's look at something that we know comes from space and lands on the Earth all the time, and that's meteorites. If we take meteorites, as you'll be doing later in this course, in the red course, you'll be examining some work on meteorites. If you explore meteorites and you open them up and you do an analysis, you will find they're absolutely teeming with organic material and prebiotic material. Indeed, many of the molecules in the meteorites are not used, have not been picked up by life as we know it. So life's maybe only selected a subset of the molecules it could have done by coming in from meteorites. So we have this picture then that, that, that the chemistry which underpins life on our planet and perhaps on other planets starts out there in the empty cold regions of space. Now, space is cold at 10 Kelvin and space is very empty, it's a good vacuum. So in the 1970s, when people were kind of contemplating whether chemistry could occur in the detail in space, most people would have said no, because you, to, to have a chemical reaction, you often have to overcome some activity, a barrier, activation energy, uh, and there's no energy to do that. In space. And secondly, the idea of molecules actually finding each other to react in the first place is so low, because the, the pr pressure is so low and the collisions are so few which tends to suggest that you can't do this by gas phase chemistry. If you react a, an iron in a molecule, then those activation barrier problem tends to go away. So you can make some of the simple molecules that way. But nonetheless, this is not going to solve our problem. But if we look in space, what we see are these kind of regions in space that look empty, look like a hole in space, as shown in the top diagram here. Now, of course, this actually isn't a hole. What it is, is a dust cloud made up of lots of little small particles, tens of microns in size, which are the remnants of stars when they die and explode, a lot of this dust is thrown out. 
they gradually form a dust cloud and it's the collapse of this dust cloud that forms the stars and the planets as we know. But if we have a surface, if we have some kind of surface on which we can collect some of those other molecules which are floating around in space, maybe we have a place where things can happen. So this is our process today. We believe the molecules are made in space. They're part of the process of making stars and planets. And somehow they are then able to possibly come to a, a, a newly born planet and seed it. So let's look a bit more at this dust grain hypothesis. We have these dust grains made of either carbon or silicate. They're very cold. Therefore, any atom or molecule that collides with it will probably stick to it almost with a 100% efficiency. So gradually what will happen is this dust cloud, this dust grain, will build up an icy layer here shown here in blue. This dust uh, ice grain can then be uh, uh, treated to a various amount of energetic processes. So for example, a star may form and the ultraviolet light from the star may bathe these dust grains in the uh, outer part of the dust cloud um, with light, UV active light, which is capable of breaking up chemical bonds and triggering chemistry. That's our photochemistry. We also have cosmic rays always in space. And as these cosmic rays strike this grain, they may liberate, they may break up the molecules or liberate secondary particles by electrons, which can also induce chemistry. If atoms are floating around in space like hydrogen and they hit the surface, they are also, and therefore they can do atom addition chemistry. We have other energy sources like shock waves coming from supernova that may pass through the cloud and they produce uh, particles traveling at very fast hypervelocity speeds, which may smash into the grain and also produce chemistry. And finally, at some stage, these dust grains will move into a region where perhaps it's slightly warmer, and therefore we may have some thermal chemistry as the grain starts to warm up. That's the hypothesis. The question is, is it true? So to do this, we have a classic triangle. We perform the laboratory experiment. We compare it with models of the processes. And if the laboratory and the models then come together, they should be able to explain the observations. But the observations in turn may also tell us about the temperature and the pressure conditions of parts of the cloud that we're looking in, and therefore inform the laboratory experiments we want to do. So astrochemistry experiments have uh, developed um, over the last few decades and they basically consist of an experimental system similar to this. We have to produce a very good vacuum in which we do these experiments. Now, typically we, 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 we can produce a vacuum of between 10 to the minus eight and 10 to the minus 10 uh, millibar. That is still high compared to the actual physical uh, pressure equivalent in space, which might be 10 to the minus 11 or more. We wish to produce the cold conditions of space. But this can be done by using a helium cryostat, which means we can cool down the ice to 10 Kelvin. And then we can heat the ice up to whatever temperature we want. So for example, we could heat it up to a planetary ice surface or, or surface uh, temperature of a moon or something like Jupiter's moon. This is all done inside a vacuum system where we have the cryostat and we mount a sample off the end of the cryostat. Here you can see a demonstration. We have a heat shield, we have a cold finger and we mount our sample off it. And then we do the irradiation of that ice. We deposit the ice on the cold finger, whatever mixture we wish to look at, and then we irradiate it um, with, um, with some energy, maybe an iron beam, for example, if we're looking at the iron induced chemistry, for example, on the Jovian moons or cosmic rays, might be ultraviolet light if we want to look at uh, photochemistry. Uh, and then we analyze what we make uh, by usually by a spectroscopic technique, usually an infrared technique or sometimes a UV technique to see what we've made after we've done the irradiation. We can also heat the, uh, the cryostat up and we can evaporate off the molecules we made and analyze them with a mass spectrometry. Uh, 
most of the experiments, a lot of experiments have been done to mimic this photochemistry. Now, what we need therefore is a light source that's good to mimic the equivalent photon range of a star. And to do that, we use synchrotron radiation uh, where we can tune the radiation across a wide range of energies from 500 uh, close to the visible end through to uh, the uh, uh, vacuum ultraviolet, uh, the Lyman alpha edge around about 110, 120 nanometers. We can also irradiate these ices with iron beams to mimic the cosmic rays. Or again, if we're looking at a, a planet with a moon, say for example, Jupiter, we can look at the irradiation of the, of the lunar surface by uh, the magnetospheric ions produced in Jupiter. We can replicate that by using iron beams uh, from iron beam accelerators. This one example here, the one that we use, for example, in Atomki, which is a, a nuclear physics institute in Debrecen in Eastern Hungary. And we can tune the type of ions we want. We can use photons, helium ions, we can use heavy ions, oxygen and sulfur ions. They can be singly charged, they can be multiply charged, and they can be over a wide range of energy from tens of kilovolts through to uh, several mega electron volts, depending on the type of accelerator that we use. We can also produce these shock waves. We can look at grains bouncing into each other, uh, or we can produce a, a rarefied shock wave from a gas jet, uh, which comes down and, and, and creates a kind of shock wave of, 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 of gas onto the dust grain and see what it makes. Uh, at the University of Kent, we have a light gas gun where we can collide particles. Or we can fire particles into ice to see the change. And in India, there's many shock tube facilities where they do these, these shock wave analysis. And we'll see an example of that later. So we've got many different types of experiments that we can do. What have they shown us? What have we learned? Well, what we have learned is that we can easily synthesize more complex molecules from very simple ice mixtures. So the, typically the most dominant uh, ice in space is water ice, followed by carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide with small amounts of methanol, ammonia, and methane. And you'll see again that some of these molecules are the same as the ones that uh, Uwe and Miller suggested as being in the early Earth's atmosphere. Now here's a simple experiment where I just take two of those molecules, carbon dioxide and water, and I mix them together. And then I take an infrared spectrum. This is an infrared spectrum of them. And what I take from my infrared spectrum of the ice before I irradiate it is I will see characteristic peaks of which some of which are the carbon dioxide, some of which are the water ice. I then irradiate that ice with some fluids, which can be compared to however, whatever the fluence might be in the interstellar medium. What we do in an hour, of course, will be thousands, ten thousands, or even millions of years of irradiation in the interstellar medium. But we can look and see what we make after that type of irradiation. And the green curve now shows after an hour of irradiation we have several new peaks. What do we expect to make? Well, if we break up the carbon dioxide, we'd easily expect to make carbon monoxide. We now have an oxygen atom left over in the ice, which might then form a short-lived radical like CO3. CO3 will then dissolve in the water and form a well-known carbonic acid. And that's what the other peaks are. So a fairly simple <clears throat> mixture of just two ices you can see it can already start to make some other interesting molecules. If we then warm up the ice, uh, we evaporate the volatiles as we call them, that's the water, the CO2 and the CO, and we're left with a more non-volatile material, which in this case is the carbonic acid. And this is a, a typical spectrum of solid carbon, uh, carbonic acid in the ice phase and in the solid phase. And we see, and that could be seen, that could be expected to be formed, for example, on Mars, which is the ice caps are just water and CO2. And the carbonic acid being an acid, if it was formed on Mars, would then have a weathering effect, would be able to look at the rocks. Now, that's not going to be seen in the current Gale Crater or where we've sent some of the rovers now. You would have to go to the poles to see that. So that's a very simplistic way of making ice. The question is, if you now mix together more complicated ice mixtures, can you indeed, by these simple processing methods, either ultraviolet light or ions, 
or indeed the secondary electrons, which are produced both by photoionization or ion-induced ion ionization, uh, or by shock waves, do you actually go on to make these more complicated molecules like the amino acids and the sugars? And the answer is yes. We now have many experiments that can show that if we take a simple dust particle and we mimic it by putting on, say, ammonia, methanol, and water, and we irradiate it with ultraviolet light, we can make very complicated molecules, like, for example, ribose, which most people would regard as almost a biological sugar. So it's easy to do the chemistry. And the important thing is that the chemistry that we do is nothing special. There's no, it would occur in any system in the universe where we had ices and we had these type of irradiation. So there's nothing special about our part of the universe, our solar system, or indeed anything that our solar system was formed for. So this answers that first question. The chemistry for life, the opportunity to make the molecules that might form life does appear to essentially be available anywhere. But what do these experiments tell us about the mechanisms? They tell us when we do this and we do these experiments, we do look happy like the cooking, um, we get the compounds. But what we need more to do is to understand the parameters by which these molecules are formed. And one of the problems we have is that in many of the experiments that we currently perform today, the parameters of the experiment are not entirely defined. This means that we often find that although allegedly in one lab we use the same ices and the same radiation source, we get some mixture of molecules. Another lab gets another mixture of molecules or may get similar molecules, but with very different ratios. So our experimental challenge is to define the parameters of the experiment. And these are just some of the parameters that an experimental astrochemist will need to do. The first thing is the morphology of the ice. What type of ice do we have? Is it a crystalline ice? Is it a polycrystalline ice? Is it a totally amorphous ice? Is it a mixture of the both? Because the type of the morphology might, for example, determine how easily reactive species move through the ice to react with one another. The second parameter is, of course, temperature. At very low temperatures, the species we make may be very immobile. We may make some reactive species, but they are kind of bit frozen in space of the in in, in the spatial uh, part of the uh, of the of the ice and don't move around very much. That means they only become active when we introduce maybe some heating, either by a shock wave or some other process. And the vacuum environment is going to be important. If other species are in the vacuum, we might, for example, form a very thin layer of water on top of our, of our, of our ice um, without knowing it or without quantifying it. Also, the substrates on which we do the experiments are often not dust grains. Dust grains themselves are, are, are not easy to make and they are not very good for trying to do spectroscopy from. They're not a reflective surface. Many of our ice films are mounted on transparent substrates, like, for example, the top one here, which is a zinc selenide. The ice layer is formed on top of it, and we process the ice on top of it, and then the infrared beam passes through both the ice and the substrate. But if we believe that, there, that the chemistry might be, uh, have a role of the binding between the ice and the reaction between the ice and the surface of the grain, then that experiment won't replicate that. So one uh, way around this is rather than trying to do these experiments on, on, on solid surfaces, on, on, on gold for reflection or for zinc selenide for transmitting, why don't we try and actually do them on a dust grain? And one way around that is to levitate the dust grains. And this is a simple experiment which was developed uh, all some years ago by a student of mine who's now a, a lecturer at the Open University in the UK, Anita Dawes. And there uh, she levitated uh, dust grains. She levitated some soot, some basic soot. I think it was taken from her grandmother's chimney. It's as simple as that first experiment. Um, but it was a rough carbonite surface. And on top of that, we put water. 
And then a standing wave was set up, an ultrasonic standing wave between a, 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 a ultrasonic transducer and a plate which reflected it back. And what was found in these experiments was when you looked at the spectroscopy of the ice now on this fractal rough surface, it seemed to be much more in tune with what was seen in the interstellar medium than we see in bulk ices. So on the left hand side, you see an observation from looking at the um, water lines um, in space in one of these dusty regions. The, 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 the sharp line is, a, is an atomic transition which we can use to calibrate the, the spectrum. On the right hand side, you see the results of the experiments. The dotted line is what you would get if your ice was purely amorphous. The solid line is what you get if the ice was solidly crystalline. What we got on the, on the, on the dust grain is the red line, which you can see looks much more like what we see. And indeed, the characterizing by what we call a red wing excess on this end of the spectrum, which is only seen when you do these experiments on these dust grains in this levitated way. What are our other challenges? Well, our other challenge is, is that uh, if we do many of these experiments, the radiation uh, flux is much higher than experiments. Indeed, it's orders of magnitude higher. Now, does that make a difference? Does it matter how much energy you put in? Well, maybe it does, because the amount of energy you deposit will depend upon the amount of charged particles and so on you've got. So we can't do experiments where we're only putting down one ion at a time or irradiating with very weak fluxes that we have in space because we've no signal. So what we have to do is we have to model the experiment and we can do a molecular dynamics simulation of very low and very slow uh, ion bombardment. And we can then increase it with the molecular simulations until we do the higher bombardments where we can actually measure them. And if the simulation agrees with the experiments of higher flux, it gives us an idea that possibly that simulation is better at doing and understanding the lower energy fluxes. We've also understood that effectively, although we might be firing ions into a system or photons into a system, effectively what they do is produce a load of secondary particles, most importantly, secondary electrons. And therefore a lot of experiments are looking at the electron induced reactions because we believe that that's many of the reactions in the ice are due to electrons and they're the ones that can synthesize glycine. We can also look at the thermal effects. We can look at how the ice changes when we warm it up and we put it through heating and cooling cycles. Interestingly, some of the molecules now, which we've looked like, like ethene thio and so on, they don't do what we expect them to do. We can put down a thin layer of ice and we can heat it up and it does what we expect it to do. We expect it to go from amorphous to crystalline, and when it's reached crystalline condition, stay in a crystalline condition. But when we started to run some thicker ices of some molecules, indeed it went amorphous to crystalline, but then completely strangely, it went back to being amorphous again. And it went through this cycle, this reversible phase change. And this is because when we're heating the ice up, we're also evaporating material from the surface. And the type of ice we get and the phase we get is a balance between the temperature and the thickness and the structure. We also know that the temperature effects are incredibly important. Uh, an experiment which proves this was just taking an irradiation of basically oxygen uh, ice, oxygen ice, O2 ice. Um, because if you irradiate O2 ice, the only thing you're likely to make is ozone O3. Interestingly, what we found that the rate of formation of ozone was much higher at low temperature than it was at high temperature. As you can see here, this is the yield. You can see at 11 Kelvin, we have more ozone forming with at 30 Kelvin. And this is because the oxygen at very low temperatures isn't a single oxygen molecule. It's already starting to form little structures, particularly van der Waal clusters. So you basically get a structure of O4 and the chemistry occurs within that structure. You'll also see on the bottom here, we make a formation of ozone. Then we turn the, uh, the electron beam off the radiation source off, we leave the ice to stabilize. And then when we start to heat it up, we get an enormous increase in the yield of ozone. That is because at 11 Kelvin, many of the oxygen atoms are trapped in the ice. But as we start to heat it up, they become labile, they become mobile, and they move through the ice to produce the ozone. 
So this shows us that the temperature effects and the way in which the dust grain is temperature uh, regulated is also going to be very important. Most importantly, we need to control and parameterize the experiments so that we can compare experiments in each other's labs and see if we are seeing the same effects. And to do that, we have to adopt a kind of statistical design for our laboratory experiments. And instead of doing one irradiation at a time, maybe we can do three or four irradiations under the ice is prepared under the same conditions. And this is an example of such a, a holder that we, we, we use in, in Hungary. So we have an experimental program in astrochemistry developing uh, in Europe and, and wider, where we're trying to, to study these icy grain surfaces and look at these properties. But we're adopting a process of what we call systems chemistry to do that. And we want to look at the, all the different parameters, fluence, ice thickness, ice temperature, instant energy, charge state of the ions, ice, ratio of the ice, ices, is of 10 to wa water to one carbon dioxide, different from a one water to 10 carbon dioxide, we call polar and apolar ices. We can have layering where we can have, for example, a polyaromatic hydrocarbon on top of water, which might be different upon having water on top of the polyaromatic hydrocarbon. We want to compare putting in the same nominal energy, say nine electron volts from a light source with nine electron volts from an electron source because photons obey selection rules, electrons do not. So electrons can access what we call the forbidden states and introduce new dissociation mechanisms of the molecule, which may lead to new chemistry, which is different from the photon chemistry. We want to look at the injection of atoms of ions into the ice compared to the liberation of atoms of ions. So what we see in the ice, is that the same as what comes out of the ice or is sputted from the ice? I guess what we would really all like is a kind of ultimate experiment where we create an interstellar medium or planetary simulation facility that we can replicate all these conditions. And we can look at the irradiation of photons, ions, neutral beams simultaneously. Because in space, we don't have photon irradiation on Monday and Tuesday, cosmic rays on Wednesday and Thursday, and ions on Friday and Saturday. They all occur together at the same time. So we need to build a facility that can do all the irradiation at the same time. This idea of having super simulation facilities is not a new one in science. It's exactly used for atmospheric chemistry in the study of environmental systems to look at atmospheric and urban pollution, for example, as an example here, uh, Safia uh, is one such example in Germany. Nonetheless, we've now formed all these building blocks of life but we haven't answered the question of cover how they assemble to make the larger molecules. And I'm afraid the answer is we still today don't know. And I often like to use this, this quote from Donald Rumsfeld, who uh, was an American uh, politician at the time of uh, the, the Gulf War. Uh, and uh, he came out famously when he was asked about news and information in uh, coming out of Iraq and so on. And he said, there are the known knowns these are the things that we know, we know, are facts. And then there are the known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know. So we know life was formed. We know that we can make these prebiotic compounds. But what we don't know is how, those more, how that process works. And possibly that's because we don't know a mechanism. And we haven't identified a mechanism. And perhaps we even haven't thought of a mechanism. In which case, these are unknown unknowns. These are the things that currently we don't know, that we don't know them, but when we do stumble across them, then they will help us. I wanted to show a few other experiments showing of how uh, these uh, molecules can be made uh, as an idea. And these are shock experiments. So this is where we got these molecules, that we've made them in space, and we're now going to bring them to the planet. And this is the the, the meteorite bombardment, if you like. So we can uh, do some shocks of amino acids in uh, primitive environments under various conditions and see if we can make larger structures. So here is a, an example taken from a, a famous book from Andre Bragg, perhaps the pioneer, many of you have heard of him on the origins of life. Uh, and uh, he was looking around at what those kind of first early molecules you might know might form the, the, the code for DNA. And he suggested lysine, aspartic acid, 
glutamic acid and adenine might, might be the molecules that would have to have come together. So we put them in a, into a shock tube. And on the left-hand side, you just see the, 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 the bits of stuff coming out of the bottles. It's all powders and you mix them up and you look something like that. It just looks like a sort of mess of powder soil, if you like. And then you produce a shock wave. And what you magically form are these very rich structures. These are almost look, looking like uh, cellular-like structures. Here's a, here's a nanotube, if you like, which you can, which you can form. And just by introducing shock waves. And maybe that's a clue to how some of the molecules start to assemble. The other perhaps clue that, that might tell us about how molecules assemble um, are amino acids uh, and nuclear acids are chiral. So that means that somehow life has, has uh, formed so that all the amino acids are left handed and all the nuclear acids are right handed. Why did life choose that? If perhaps we could understand that, we could perhaps give us a clue to how they were formed in the first place. So we have to look at ways in which those molecules might be assembled. So in summary, astrochemistry is now a mature field. We have a large and growing community, as seen in the picture at the bottom here in a meeting pre-pandemic, when the community could all get together to discuss these things. What we do need to do, and I hope I've shown in this talk, is to coordinate our activities still further, to make sure that the experiments can be cross-correlated, cross-compared, that we can adopt similar processes and ways to study our things, like, for example, adopting the systems chemistry, that the experiments can be coupled with models, so we have an idea of what sort of compounds we should get when we irradiate these ices under particular conditions. And if the models and the experiments match, we can then go and look in space in those regions where we believe we have, for example, a shock wave interacting with icy grains, or a region of space where, for example, in the formation of a protoplanetary disk, the ices are being irradiated by strong UV light, or a region that has a strong ion uh, impact. We can go and look at moons where we have ices on a surface being irradiated under con on conditions like the Jovian uh, magnetosphere. If the observation agree with the models and the experiments, then we can say that we've understood the basic chemistry that's occurring. Let me just finish by putting astrochemistry in context of the wider Red School astrobiology. This is a slide that was given to me uh, some years ago, and I've used it several times, and it's about the understanding the origin of life on Earth. And um, it's, it's meant to bring together all the things that we would need to know to understand the origins of life on Earth. And you can see the complexity of, of, of that. And indeed, many of you are probably working in perhaps one area of this, and you'll sp spend your entire career working in one area of this. But if we don't bring all these different aspects together, and we don't all interact together, then we probably never will be able to bring all the information together to answer that question of how life was assembled on Earth and are those conditions prevalent elsewhere? And is it likely, therefore, that life may have occurred on another planet around another star? And so maybe we're not alone um, after all. Thank you very much. I hope that's been a, a useful talk. I am sorry that I'm not with you uh, in person. Uh, to, uh, but I hope perhaps there might be a way now um, in this session of asking questions, even if it's just uh, maybe on a phone call. Um, anyway, um, I hope you all have a good week. Um, there are many other talks which are following mine now, which are going to take on this chemistry question uh, and bring it through to biology. So I'm sure many of the other lecturers are going to give you um, a really even greater insight into some of the things I perhaps just, just touched on in this lecture. Thank you very much. And as I said, if you're taking uh, questions, we can...